Tell us a bit more about how this sort of chip hybridization works for people who are unfamiliar. Um, I hear chip and I, well, sometimes I think potato chip, but I, I know in this case, we're probably talking about something more like maybe a, a computer chip. How does this work exactly? Yeah, so the chip is really uh, a glass slide that contains an array of DNA. And, those, and the DNA is bound to glass beads that are scattered on a regular pattern on the, on the chip. So then that DNA is designed by us to bind to the parts of the genome we're interested in. That's the process I talked about a minute ago. And it, it comes together through the process of base pairing, just like with double helix base pairing. And then either you have, let's say, an A at position, the position we're interested in, or a G. And depending on which of those two you have, will either light up green or light up red on the chip at a specific position on the chip. I see. So you essentially have sort of a discrete or, or quantum unit for every little DNA molecule that you're testing. You get a little signal that says, oh, you have an A or you have a G here. Exactly. And because humans are diploid, you'll also get situations where you have A and G, one from mother, one from father. So then what we see at that position on the chip is red and green or kind of a yellow signal you can think of it. Oh, that's really um, clever. So that it allows you to easily distinguish any given position that you're looking at. Yeah, so when we get the data at 23andMe, we actually can plot it on a simple XY plot with red on the Y axis and green on the, uh, sorry, on the X axis. And then we'll see three clusters of people who are AA, AG, and GG, because those are the three possible situations um, for this position in your genome. Mm -hmm. Then we can say, well, if you're in this cluster, because the process is called clustering, then you're AG, and if you're in this cluster, then you're AA. So there's a kind of a simple uh, analysis problem at the end of the at the end of the output there. I see, and it sounds like you're actually using sort of the information from uh, a pooled set of individuals. You know, you're sort of looking, and so even though an individual call may be difficult to know where on that graph you're you're placed, if you use this clustering, like you said, you can more readily identify. Oh, you're part of this group, so you're AA, not AG, kind of thing. That's exactly right. And there are also situations you can imagine where we get even more information. So. You could imagine a situation where you have a deletion of the part of the genome we're interested in. Mm -hmm. Then what we'll see is a new cluster, another cluster apart from the other three, with lower intensity because there's less signal there because there are fewer DNA molecules. So then a new cluster could emerge, and it could be as infrequent as one in 10,000 people or one in 100,000 people, but we'll see a little nucleus of samples there. Now, in, in lesson two of, of our course, we actually talk for the first time there about the idea of base pairing, and we learn about the base pairing rules and, and how things fit together. Um, what I find really interesting is the idea that um, in, in a double-stranded DNA, you know, you have all these letters matching with each other, is, is what you're telling is the idea that um, a single nucleotide variant is just one letter change here. That if one letter doesn't match, that essentially what's happening is the, the, the strand can't actually hybridize completely, it can't base pair completely, and that's why you, you don't see the signal for one, but you do for another? Is that essentially what's going on? It's something very close to that. So what we expect is that all of the letters leading up to the letter we're interested in will bind, mm -hmm. and like you say, if there is a, a, an error there, one difference, then it won't bind or it will bind weakly, mm -hmm. so the signal will be weak. But then the specific letter we're interested in, which will kind of come out one more base, mm -hmm. has there's a pool of A's, G's, C's, and T's floating around that can bind there mm -hmm. or not. They'll only bind if it's the if correct it's, base pair. And it's unoccupied. And it's unoccupied. Then we'll see the, uh, the extension happen, the, the reaction that leads to the, the color you know, the, the mm -hmm. color that we can see in our imaging system. That's great. And so essentially you have this, you said the chip is a, is a slide and you're looking at a million bases in this one little chip, this one little space? Yeah, so there are even more than that. There's more than a million beads per chip because it's better to read the same variant many, many times just mm -hmm. to get a good average signal. Mm -hmm. um, the reason for that is that if you're in the corner, maybe you'll get slightly different optics because the camera is looking at the center of the chip or, so, or something like that. So you just want some redundancy. I see. So it's uh, more than 10 million uh, wow. beads per chip. 
And that process has been improving over the years. The density of the, of the chips has been increasing a lot. How many chips? So, I mean, do you, have you always used the same chip or um, how do you make changes? You know, if there's a new, I guess, I don't know, a new trade or a new, um, a new SNV that you become interested in, are you able to change your chip so you can look at that? Yeah, so we update the chip approximately every 18 months. Um, we're on the third iteration right now, um, and we're constantly looking for new variants to add to the chip to improve the performance of it. So you can imagine that if there's a paper published that says this mutation in this gene causes a disease, and it's, you know, it's very interesting to be able to find that out, we can design what we call a, a probe for that, mm -hmm. which is the base, the sequence of DNA that's attached to the glass bead, and make sure it's on the next iteration of the chip. You mentioned that the hybridization process is sort of the, the longest part. Um, you said it happens over overnight. Um, yeah. What, I mean, for those of us, I mean, we've learned conceptually about base pairing, but any technical insight you might have, I mean, what's, why is this an overnight process? Essentially, it just takes time for the DNA in your saliva and the extracted saliva sample to find the right bead. So you want to give it time to just search around in the solution, find the right bead, and bind there. And that, that takes time. I see. It takes time just based on how quickly the DNA moves around and how tightly it binds. Um, and what do you use to measure the results? Are you, I mean, you just like snapping a picture of the chip? Um, what's actually happening? Yeah, so it's very close to that. Um, in essence, you get what's called a fluorophore attached to the, the bead mm -hmm. because of the presence of the A or the G at that position. Um, that's the red or green signal. You, you shoot a laser at it to excite the fluorophore, and then you take a photograph of it with a digital camera. So a lot of it is um, very much you know, digital camera based, which is that's interesting that that technology allowed our technology. Yeah, that, and it also sounds like, I mean, I know how big my digital camera uh, picture files are. That sounds like it's a, it's a lot of data, a lot of information that, that you end up with. Yeah, so all of that data from this giant um, image file gets processed by the software that's actually run at our lab in Los Angeles and translated into the XY plot that I mentioned before. Because for each bead on the chip, really all we're interested in is how much red is there in there and how much green. The photograph itself is not terribly useful after we've extracted that data. 